And but they went further. They literally said that when when talking about enemies of the revolution, farmers in particular should be regarded as the enemy, and that includes their families and their their children and so forth. And that was repeated when when I don't know if for the viewers who saw the documentary Tainted Heroes. When I interviewed Sepiwi in Yanda, who was a commander of Nkontuwi Sizwe, I asked him about this and he said, yes, we farmers were our target, were part of our target, and we knew, and we planted those landmines, and we knew that their wives and their children would die um, as a result of that. But that's a decision that we had to make, um, and, and we stand by that. Hello, my name is Donald and welcome to the number one media company, Worldview. At Worldview, we explore everyone's perspectives on all things that can broaden our worldview. Today, we're talking again with the land thief who calls himself Aaron's Roots. Aaron's is the deputy CEO of AfriForum and the author of the book, Kill the Boer, which is an amazing and well-researched book, but at the same time, frightening. Nevertheless, a definite must read. So Aaron's, welcome back to the show. Before we start with the book, how was your trip to the CPAC conference? Hmm. Well, thank you very much um, also for that introduction. Um, so I recently came back from a trip to Europe where I spent a week in uh, the Netherlands and a week in, in Hungary. Um, and it was during the week in Hungary where CPAC was hosted. It was CPAC is the Conservative Political Action Conference, which is the biggest uh, conservative conference in the world. It's an American conference. The CPAC initiative is to take it to different parts of the world. And this was, for some reason, the first CPAC in Europe. So CPAC has been going on since the 1970s in America. And this was the first time that it was hosted in, in Europe. And they chose Hungary and, and Budapest more particularly. And I, um, having attended CPAC twice before, and having met some of the organizers and having i've had some discussions with some of the people at cpac so they know about every forum and the work that we are doing and i was privileged enough to to be invited to to act as a speaker um, um, at cpac which was a really really great experience for me but more important than that as i've been saying um, what i found most valuable was not the opportunity to deliver a speech but the opportunity to meet all those people, to have backstage access, to meet all the other speakers, to have conversations with them, and to, to also um, learn from what they know about South Africa, um, which I thought was very interesting. And, and the short version thereof is that, that people are much more aware about South Africa than we tend to think. I'm not talking about the average person you meet on the street, but I'm talking about journalists and people who are somehow involved with politics or podcasts and, and so forth. Um, but it's very politically incorrect to talk about South Africa. You can criticize the governments of different countries. Um, uh, you can criticize the government of Indonesia or the government of South Korea or the government of Argentina. I mean, I'm just listing random countries. But when you criticize the government of South Africa, then that's extremely politically incorrect because the world has been led to believe that South Africa was this evil place, and then the 90s, the 1990s happened, and South Africa was freed through this miracle, and the party of Nelson Mandela is now in control, so everything is well. And if you criticize South Africa, it means that you go against that narrative, which is a difficult thing to do, but the good news is that people in, in and I, I've really experienced this having been overseas a few over the last decade, quite a few times, and speaking with people, I can really see that people are waking up to this to this reality, which is good news. Yeah, basically history stopped for South Africa in 1994, and it's just a rainbow nation since then. Yeah, yeah, that's that's the perception, and it's 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 odd if you if you look at it that way, because uh, well, because I mean, the, the rest of the world have been so involved in South Africa and and so outspoken about South Africa, especially during the 1980s. Um, and, and the 1990s, the early 1990s, up until 94, or you could even say up until 96, when the South African constitution was adopted, and then everyone just vanished. Um, and it's like, job done, now move on. And um, now let's move to the next country that we have to save, you could almost say. And the, the point is, I think there are some, some very important lessons um, 
that we have learned in South Africa, and I think, and that was my message at CPAC, that the conservative movement, I'm using the word conservative in the broad sense of the word, um, in the world should learn from, that, 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 that we have experienced certain things that the rest of the world is still going to experience, um, um, such as that certain policy ideas that people in America and Europe are flirting with have already been implemented in South Africa. Uh, we have um, uh, demographic realities that, that, that America and Europe doesn't have uh, and, and, and so forth, cultural realities, political realities. Um, and, and so I think there's a lot that the rest of the world can learn from in, in South Africa. And, and our message there has been that even though in many ways we are behind the rest of the world, I'm absolutely convinced that in the most important way, South Africa is way ahead of the rest of the world and, and the rest of the world should be taking note of what's happening in South Africa. What is it like to meet many of these conservative leaders? I saw a photo of you and Candace Owens. What was it like to meet many of these people? Well, it, it was a great privilege. And, and the great thing about something like CPAC is there's the conference, which is a two-day conference, but then there are three um evening events which are more social gatherings dinners cocktail evenings and so forth um where especially the speakers were invited to and um, so it's smaller and it's just an opportunity to liaise with people and i, I met really people from from all over the world as i can as i said yeah i i, I remember speaking with with people from israel from australia from um, the netherlands from belgium from England, from France, uh, Hungary, of course, uh, South Korea, um, and America. Those, 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 those are the ones I can just remember um, off the top of my head sitting here now. And, and it was a great opportunity. And, and what I found so interesting about this is, is how everyone has their own um, perspective. An alien person who regards himself as conservative would have a different approach than an American who regards himself as conservative. And certainly the Hungarians have a different approach. Um, and, and the South Koreans as well. So there's a CPAC in South Korea. Japan was also there with Japanese representatives also there, which was, which was very interesting. Brazil, people from Brazil as well. Um, but, but in terms of meeting the people, um, so you mentioned Candace Owens. Um, she, she was just delightful. Um, so um, obviously, Candace Owens is very well known. She was one of the best known speakers um, at this event. Um, and I found her to be very approachable, very friendly, very down to earth, um, not sort of, you know, high up in the air type, saw her backstage and, and she was speaking with someone whom I've already met. So I went and I introduced myself. And she was very interested. And I said to her, listen, I just want her to know that she has, um, um, there's a, there are a lot of people in South Africa who follow what she does and who, who appreciate the work she's doing. And she was very flattered to hear that. And we had a, I don't know, five minute conversation about what's happening in South Africa. And I invited her to come to South Africa, which I'm, I'm sure she will do sometime in the future. So um, yeah, it was great. It was really, a, 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 I'm, I'm very privileged to, to have been able to attend an event like that. Yeah, if she comes to South Africa, then she can actually say she's an African American. But um, so, <laughs> yes, so exactly. What is it like? What is Hungary like? I know, for example, many South Africans have fled, quote unquote, to Hungary, and they like the leader there. What What is your perception of that country? So Hungary is a very interesting place um, at the moment. Um, and Hungary has, in a way, become the target of, you could say, the left. Um, you could say sort of the mainstream political, global political establishment. Uh, because Hungary has a very particular view about uh, their religion and their culture and their traditions that have to be protected. Um, so Hungary has a, is, is, in a strange way, the Hungarians are very similar to the Afrikaners. Um, we have had historically some overlapses. There were some Hungarians who fought in the Anglo-Boer War um, and, and Jan Smits, when he was um, involved with um, international politics, um, uh, criticized the Trianon Treaty, according to which Hungary lost um, some of its, its uh, large part, uh, well, about 60% of its uh, surface area um, of its land, you could say. And, and so there's been some interactions, but not too many. But in a way, we are very similar. Like the, the same way Afrikaners would say that we are, you know, we are Westerners, but we are, but Africa is, is part of our identity. Um, the Hungarians talk like that about the East. 
um, in the sense that the East and and um, they've been very influenced by the East and by Turkey and, and, and so forth. And they regard that as part of their heritage. They have their own language. Uh, they are very Christian, um, social conservative. And, and I think the main trigger here was, well, there are a few triggers. I, I'd say two of the most important triggers is the one that, that Viktor Orban's government, the Fidesz government, is very successful. And I mean, I, I'm talking about economic growth and just modernizing the country. And, and, and just to mention an example, on when I was there the one Sunday, I just went for a walk. And I, at one stage, I stopped counting how many construction cranes I saw. So as, if you stand at the, the castle, which is sort of on the hill, I could just turning around, I could see about 50 construction cranes. So all over there's just construction and development and, and, and the, the economy is doing well. So, so the fact that it's a conservative government, an openly Christian government, that's doing very well is, is a source of annoyance to a lot of people. And the other trigger was, was the immigration crisis, crisis in Europe, um, where the European Union uh, largely, almost unanimously took a particular approach, that, you know, that we have to take in immigrants and, and so forth. And the Hungarians and the Polish, you could add, took a different line. And the Hungarians said, we'll take in people if they share our culture, our religion, our values. But um, we're not just going to take in people at random because eventually it, it's a, it, it will change the demographics of the country and it, it becomes a cultural reality and it, it, we don't think it's sustainable. Um, so Hung Hungary has become sort of a beacon in a way of conservative government and it's also become a very significant target, which is strange because it's a fairly small country. Um, if you look at the, at the map of Europe, you'll see Hungary is very small compared to Germany or France, for example. Um, but but Hungary ha has a significant in significant influence on world politics at the moment because of the fact that that they are so successful. Interesting. Okay, so this is quite a big pivot to kill the boar. But yes. in your book, <laughs> there's a very interesting point you made about ANC torture camps and its relation oh, yeah. to farm murders. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, well, I think in a way there is a good pivot from Hungary to the book because when I was in Hungary now, they've expressed quite significant interest in the book as well. And in fact, I that's one of the main things, one of the main reasons I went to Hungary now is we signed an agreement for the book to be translated to Hungarian, uh, which will be published there soon. So I'm very much looking forward to that. But, but the torture camps thing is something that should be part of the discussion about farm murders that is almost never said. So I'm actually glad you asked the question. Um, I, in the book, I explain the methods of torture that people that you often see um, at these farm murders that a lot of the viewers would already know of. It include, includes things like burning victims with melted items like melted plastic or, or stuff like that or boiled, uh, boiled water and, and, and these type of things beating people, you know, using whips or sticks or rods or, or blunt objects to beat people with, trampling on people and so forth. Um, and there's an important part of the discussion that is, again, very politically incorrect, but there's, it's based on historic facts um, um, and it's been properly investigated. Um, it's not really discussed. And that's the, the, let's call it the potential link to be safe um, or the, to be conservative between the, the methods of torture that we see during farm murders and the methods of torture that was applied by members of the ANC in, in exile, in ANC torture camps. Um, and there were torture camps that was investigated. I think I mentioned in the book, there were three different independent investigations, including one by Amnesty International. Quattro was the most notorious. It was a camp where, you know, the ANC regarded themselves as a liberation militant organization. And so they had camps with political prisoners. Um, and Quattro was one of the most famous ones, which was a torture camp. People went there and they were tortured there. They had to do hard labor and a lot of people were killed, um, were tortured to death in, in these camps. And it includes strange methods of torture. They had to push big barrels, I think, up a hill, which sometimes they, they couldn't continue and the barrels rolled over them as it came back. But then there were other methods like, like burning people with, with melted items, uh, trampling on people, you know, stomping on them, beating them with, with sticks and whips and, and blunt objects and so forth. Um, and why is this? So that's one part of the story. But there's another part of this puzzle. 
And that is that these camps obviously were a reality largely due to the fact or partly due to the fact that 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 uh, the, or partly due to the suppression of communism act which declared that it was illegal to promote communism in south africa um and so the anc went in exile because they were aligned with the communist party and and the soviet union and so these camps were there because of the suppression of communism act uh, largely then in 1990 those that legislation was repealed and the anc was able to come back from exile um, the the people often say the ANC was unban was banned and then it was unbanned. Technic the more correct way to to frame it is the ANC was declared an illegal organization, and that declaration was then withdrawn in the 1990s. So they came back, but but what is significant is when they came back. That's really when farm murders became a reality. So farm murders was not a significant reality in in before 1990. Um, in 1989 and or the 1980s, there were isolated incidents like the, the landmine in Messina, the well-known landmine that killed the uh, members of the Van Ack and the Nason families, um, which was planted by the ANC. And there were incidents, there were bombings, but there were not widespread farm attacks and farm murders as we know them today. And that suddenly started in the 1990s, in the same year in which these these torture camps were closed down and the people who were involved with those camps came back to South Africa. Now, we do not know if those people were involved with farm attacks, but it's an important part of the discussion that we're not having. So essentially, it can be possible that many of these farm murders are committed by former Nkutu we seize where operatives, many of them who um, worked in these torture camps. I, I think it's, it's, it's highly likely. Um, because it's 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 a reasonable conservative conclusion. I'm not when I say conservative, I don't mean ideological. I just mean being conservative in how you reach conclusions. Um, it's uh, I'm struggling to think of a more um, rational way to think about this. Is we had a group of people who had polit political goals, who who were involved with tortures. Um, who came back into South Africa, and we're talking about large numbers, 11 or 13,000 people, if, if I recall. I think it was 13,000 ANC members in exile who came back into South Africa. And then suddenly the farm murders and the farm tortures started. And what I, what I didn't say, what, which was also an important part of the puzzle, is the ANC had an active policy of targeting soft targets. They made it an active, they, they, they took a decision in 1985 in Kabwe, that they don't need to differentiate between hard and soft targets, um, that they can kill innocent people. Um, that's literally what their policy was. Uh, they they soft soaked it in how they explained it to the media. The way they explained it, they said, sometimes we will be in military engagements with the, the apartheid forces, and then there will be, there might be innocent people caught in the crossfire, and we couldn't, you know, we shouldn't let that deter us. But that wasn't the reality. The reality wasn't that there were these massive clashes between ANC forces and government forces where they were shooting at each other and innocent people were running up and down between them as they were shooting. That's just not, it's just detached from reality. And But they went further. They literally said that when when talking about enemies of the revolution, farmers in particular should be regarded as the enemy. And that includes their families and their, their children and so forth. And that was repeated when, when, I don't know, for the viewers who saw the documentary Tainted Heroes, when I interviewed Sepiwi and Yanda, who was a commander of Mkontuwi Sizwe, I asked him about this and he said, yes, we farmers were our target, were part of our target, and we knew, and we planted those landmines, and we knew that their wives and their children would die um, as a result of that. But that's a decision that we had to make, um, and, and we stand by that. And so, so they had a policy of, of attacking farmers, killing farmers. They actively regarded farmers as being the enemy. And they had torture camps. They were in exile. They come, came back from exile. And suddenly the farm murders became a reality. So it's, it's a very strange, well, strange is not the correct word. It's a very alarming phenomenon that, that we don't get to talk about enough. Uh, Adams, you've, you've probably heard and read um, Dr. Anfia Jeffrey's book, The People's War. Yes. Um, yes. Where it's, I'm going to interview her tomorrow, and I yeah I look forward to that conversation as well. So so she lays out that uh, they basically basically systematically eliminated the opposition, like in Carter, yeah. by political killings, and then every time in Carter responded in force, 
and then they get, got the bad reputation essentially. Um, but if you count everything together, it was actually ANC doing far more damage than in Carter. Um, so, yeah. do you think this 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 era of violence orchestrated by the ANC is responsible not just for farm murders, but generally why South Africa is such a violent country to this day? It's basically all all has roots in the ANC. Yes, well, well the ANC actively encouraged and created a culture of violence in South Africa. There, there's no doubt about that. They, they even spoke about it in their own policy documents and making the country ungovernable and making the people unruly and so forth. Um, so there's no doubt about that, that, that they have to be, you know, held responsible for that. I think that there are many reasons, there are probably many reasons why South Africa is such an unruly, violent place. Uh, part of it, I would say, is this, the breakdown of, or, or the, this, this um, uh, culture of violence that was created. But a second part is just the breakdown of healthy, sustainable communities. I mean, community has always been part of, of life uh, for as long as we can remember, for as long as life has existed. People have been organized in communities. And there's a, 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 there's a sense of what constitutes a, what constitutes a healthy sustainable community which is a group of people who have some things in common who live close to one another who work together for if you put it in philosophical terms who work together for the common good and and we don't have that in south africa a lot of that has been broken down and um, in the same way that a lot of that has been broken down in europe after the first world war which was one of the reasons which led to the second world war is that that there was just this complete break breakdown of healthy sustainable community life um, and everything that went with that. So, so there are a lot of problems, but I think this point, and you mentioned it now, is very important. I think that's one of the most, other than just the, 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 the vast volume of facts and data in, in, in Dr. Jeffrey's book about the people's war, one of the most important things to take from that book is, is this revolutionary approach of the difference between your enemy and your rivals. And it's still a reality today. So oftentimes today you hear people, especially white people say, oh, I, I see when, when the ANC and the EFF are at each other's throats. Uh, uh, fortunately, at least they will leave the minorities alone and, and or something like that. But the, that's not really how it works. So the ANC had a an enemy, which was the apartheid government or the white minority government. And then they had rival organizations, which was, you could describe them as your, their competition, political competition. And that was uh, groups like Inkata, especially, um, Azapu, you could even add Black Consciousness, the Black Consciousness movement to that, who were rivals to the ANC for political power. So the question was one day when the apartheid system falls, as everyone knew it's going to happen sometime, um, who's going to take over power? And the ANC looked around them and they saw, oh, well, it could be Inkata, it could be Prince Butelezi, it could be someone from the Black Consciousness movement or Azapu. So in order for us to take control, we have to eliminate these rivals. We have to severely weaken them. We have to, we have to instill fear into their members and members of the community so that they don't want to join those organizations. Um, and, and so those were their rivals. And in order for them to gain power, they had to destroy their rivals. And, and that's the same, same type of thing if, that explains the EFF type thinking is they have an enemy, which you could say in their frame of reference is white people. And they have rivals. So the ANC would be their rival, although ideologically they agree with them on a lot of things. It's just their competition on the route to some revolution. So if the EFF is fighting with the ANC, it doesn't mean that the ANC is their enemy. It just means that they are they are, are struggling against each other for political support in order to to you could you know frame it very pessimistically and say in order to destroy the enemy, because they somehow think that. For them to have a revolution, they have to destroy something to to be set free. But, but that's an important part of political life and 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 revolutionary theory, you could say. That that I think people should should take note of. I I don't know if we can talk about the case that currently Afri Forum has against Julius Malema, mm. or just yeah, one, we can. one question yeah. in terms. I I saw much of that discussion that Mark Oppenheimer, um, advocate Mark Oppenheimer, had with Julius Malema, and obviously you were part of the audience, or I don't know what you call it, mm. back in yeah. the pews. 
But what was very fascinating is Julius Malema kept making this argument that sort of saying white people is not a very absolute term. When he says white people, he's referring only to those who are racist who are, or those who are enemies, but it doesn't refer to everyone. Do you, do you buy yeah. that argument or do you think that's sort of a, he's, he's trying to make a sort of a legal argument to get out of whatever awaits him? No, what, what that is, it's something that I mentioned in my testimony in that case is there's a debating tactic that, that people call the Martin Bailey strategy. And that's basically the old castle. So you had a tower, uh, which was the Bailey, you could say. And then you had the big castle wall outside. Um, and oftentimes there were two. There was this big area in the castle. And then there was a smaller section in sort of in the middle or oftentimes on a hill. And the, it was the Mott and then the Bailey. And so the, the Mott and Bailey tactic, and that's typically something that, that the organizations like the EFF and even the ANC use all the time. So what that basically means is you make some form of an outrageous statement um, that, and in a way to see what the reaction is. If you, if you get called out, you know, they don't necessarily think about it that way, but that's just how the tactic works. And that's like when you get attacked, you fight down, you know, in, b below the, behind the first wall, you could say. And then when you get called out for that, you return to the Bailey. And what I, what I mean by that practically is you make this outrageous claim like, you know, white people are the enemy. And then someone comes up to you, for example, in a court of law and says, well, that's just openly racist. And then you, you pretend like your original statement wasn't really that radical. Um, so that's when you return sort of to a second phase or you, you retreat in a way from your original argument. And you say, no, I actually meant it metaphorically and I didn't really mean it the way the, the, way that you are interpreting it. So you are actually the problem. And it's something they do all the time. Um, they would actively encourage violence if you listen to their speeches. And then if they get confronted, they would say, no, it was just a metaphor and, and, and all that. When the fact of the matter is that people, their audience, don't think about it as metaphors. Um, oftentimes, they um, they oftentimes see this as literal. So when the when the EFF sings "kill the boy, kill the farmer," and they th sing "shoot to kill," and they make these hand gestures as if they are shooting, they make sounds as if they're shooting with machine guns, um, and they get called out on that. They would say, "No, it's just a struggle song," and it was it was uh, figuratively speaking, but. You know, you can make that argument, but that doesn't necessarily mean that the audience who have been riled up after a 45 minute speech will regard that song as figuratively speaking or just as a metaphor. So there's a great cartoon. Um, I can't remember who drew the who drew it. Might have been might have been Zapiro even, um, where two um, people committed a farm murder and they were running out of the house, and then. Um, there's, if I recall the cartoon correctly, then there's a radio, I think, which says that singing Kill the Boer is just a metaphor. And then the one murderer asked the other one, what, what is a metaphor? <laughs> um, that sort of sort of explains this, this phenomenon. That, um, and it's this Martin Bailey tactic, saying, making these outrageous claims and then going back saying, no, I, re I didn't really mean it the way you interpret. And uh, so, uh, and, and, and during that court proceedings, uh, Julius Malema also said, if he wanted to give an order to kill farmers, he would just say it. He would never use a song, whatever. It, if they, they only respond to a command, what would you say to that? Yeah, so, so you, you can never predict a court case like that. Um, we've had court cases where we say to each other, we, we think we're going to lose. Um, and sometimes we think that and then we win. Sometimes we're involved with court cases, knowing from the beginning that it's probably a losing battle. But you have to fight the battle nonetheless as a matter of principle. Um, one such example is these, um, these uh, you know, the transformation at public universities. It's us fighting against that is almost a delaying tactic um, to keep, for example, Afrikaans as medium of instruction at the University of Pretoria. Um, it's a losing battle. If we really want to sustainably have Afrikaans as a medium of instruction, we need to have private universities. Um, so, so the, but why I mention this is, is this case, I don't think we're going to lose. We might, we might get a judgment that says, no, there wasn't hate speech. And the reason why I'm a bit more confident now is especially because of the cross-examination of Julius Malema, where I think um, 
Advocate Oppenheimer did, did a stellar job. I think he did an excellent job of exposing Malema for who he really was. And so the first day was sort of just getting him to talk about their policy ideas and then the second day to really zoom in. Um, and, and when you talk about hate speech, hate speech is not entirely, it's not a crime. It's sort of somewhere between, you could say, a civil case and a criminal case. It's not something that you go to prison for or you get a criminal record for. It is something that a court can order, can, can find that you committed hate speech and you have to apologize and you have to make a, um, you have to pay a fine or pay money for, you know, to some organization. Uh, you have to be punished in some way. Um, but part of the definition of hate speech, which in a way is a complicated definition, is that you have to consider context. Um, the definition of hate speech does not ask what did the person who said those things mean or what does that person say he meant? The question is how, how could it reasonably be construed? Could it reasonably be construed to have caused harm, um, to have targeted a particular section of society and, and so forth? And, and, and so we have to consider context. And the context was given by Julius Malema. So there was one moment where, where Julius Malema, where Julius made a, a, um, a mistake, a tactical mistake. He said, um, he was asked about them making these gestures, gun, you know, as if they were shooting with firearms um, and, and how that could be interpreted. And then he said, well, if I really wanted to kill people, I would not make gestures with my hand. I would take an actual gun and I would go on stage and fire an actual gun. Um, and then, you know, Oppenheimer asked him, so would you go on a stage and fire an actual gun? And then Malema said, come again. <laughs> and then he said, well, I'm asking you, would you go on stage and fire an actual gun? And then he said, you're trying your luck. And then eventually he couldn't answer and he refused to answer and his lawyers objected. And the reason why they objected was he's currently being prosecuted for that, for exactly that, for having gone on stage with an actual gun and having fired it. Um, so that's one side of it. The other side is, is so we're talking about, does it cause harm? And so we had victims of farm attacks testify about how do they respond when they hear, after having had a loved one, for example, murdered next to you in bed during a farm attack, and you hear Julius Malema chanting, kill the boy, kill the farmer. What sort of impact does that have on you? And um, Malema just said he doesn't care for those people at all. He doesn't care at all what, what those people think it's irrelevant to him how the victims of farm murders feel about him singing that song which makes it a lot worse which also indicates to him to to the song causing harm and to the fact that he might deliberately have the intention also to cause harm um, even though intention is not part of the the definition of hate speech and then the other side is the point you mentioned he was asked about actually taking up arms and starting to kill people and he said, no, he hasn't, he hasn't called for violence uh, for, uh, against white people. Um, and then he said, no, but as, as he has said before, uh, he's not calling for the slaughtering of white people, at least for now. And he was then cross-examined on that. And he eventually said, he, he cannot make a pledge that he will never call for white people to be exterminated in South Africa because he might one day do that. He cannot pledge that he will never do that because there's a chance that he will do that one day. So having regard, regarded all of that context, and then this is the guy who sings, kill the boy, kill the farmer, um, who chants at political rallies, and not only political rallies, at, the, at the, a, a court case where people are being trialed for having murdered a farmer. Um, I would be surprised if a court find that that isn't hate speech. Um, if it is, if the court finds that, I would be very interested to read the court's reasoning. But um, I think Malema strengthened our case, and I think he knows it, because at some stage towards the end of his testimony, he said something like, this is what I stand for, and this is what I believe, and if this means that I'm going to lose this case as a result of me saying these things, then so be it. Um, so I think he's prepared to lose the case as well. Um, but we'll see. We'll see when the court gives judgment in the matter. Yeah, it was very interesting that moment where Mark Oppenheimer and obviously the media cut selective clips and made it look like Mark was this buffoon. And, and only they only put clips of Julius Malema responding, not Mark delivering yes. a rebuttal. It's obviously you're, you're, pu you're, you're, you're pulling it all, all of it out of context. So, I mean, they did their yeah. job as traditionally expected. But th th that moment where Mark asked him, um, will he ever call for the slaughter of white people? And he refused to say he won't. He won't. He won't ever do it. 
It, it would have been mm. very interesting if Mark asked him, okay, will you ever call for the slaughter of, of most black people or Indian people? And if, oh, yeah, and yeah. if he said, oh. yes, I, I, I won't ever call for the slaughter of those people, then why Why do you... Um, why do you only yeah. focus on white people? Why, yeah. why are you prepared to say, I will never call for the slaughter of black people, Indian people, colored people, but for white people, there's some sort of exception. Why? Yeah, yeah, that's a very good point. Uh, uh, that's, uh, that's excellent. I think that, and it's very strange. We've been talking quite a lot about how the media covered the, the court case. So there's a clip on YouTube. I think it's called <clears throat> Julius Malema's Testimony Best Parts. And it's sort of a, you know, compilation of things he said where he has these one-liners, you know, these political sound bites. Um, and I, we had a discussion recently to say how much of that by the journalists, by the media who reported on that case was, and obviously not all of them, but at least some of them, how much of that was deliberately framing the, the court case in a particular way? Or how much of that is just bad journalism or... or um, uh, I don't know, not not being capable of doing their job properly. Because if you read, if you read some of the news reports about that court case, it it's sort of detached from reality compared to if you were actually in court. If you spend those few days in court and then you read how it was reported in some publications, um, it's it's quite alarming. And so my colleague um, Aaron van Sale, who's on Twitter and YouTube as Conscious Caracal. Um, actually made a video himself. We discussed the way the media reported on this case and where he used some clips from the court case that you typically won't see in the, you know, the best parts compilations of the court case, which were actually the worst parts. And it's not only the worst parts, it's, it's the most significant parts of the testimony because it's the most shocking parts. It's the most telling parts. Um, but oftentimes you don't hear about that. You only hear sort of the the old sound bites that you hear, you know, that you hear every time, um, you know, hear this thing, you know, the, the messages about the fact that black people are poor because white people oppress them. And, and, you know, we still have, we still struggle with white supremacy and institutionalized racism, all those old, you know, messages. You, you, you would read in the news about how Malema spoke about those things, but you won't hear about how he spoke about slaughtering white people and, and, and so forth, which is very, very concerning. And it's probably part of the reason why people are losing faith in, in the media. Absolutely. Yeah, but Ernst, I have a few more questions on Kill the Boer. I'd, I'd like to hmm. touch on some of these questions. There was an incident where a man, and you met this person in prison, where he alleged oh, yeah. that the ANC paid him to commit farm murders. And on research, you found that this guy had a cell phone number connected to Latuli House. Can you can you tell us about that story? Yeah, I, I actually wondered about whether I should add that to the book. And eventually I decided that I should. Um, I just changed his name. So one day I got a call um, from someone who said to me, he is so-and-so, I can't remember how he got my number, but um, he called me on my cell phone and he said that he's in prison. He murdered someone and he wants to share some information with me. And so, you know, we set up a meeting. I went to the prison um, um, and I went to speak with him. So we had like, you know, one of these meetings that you always see in the movies with, you know, with a, a visitor visits a prisoner. And, um, and we sat down and we had a conversation and he made some really bizarre claims and um, he said or, or or shocking claims you could say or alarming claims he said that he gave me the details of the farmer he murdered which i looked up and it was well there was such a farm murder and i could read about the the story in the news there were some old news reports about this particular farmer and the court case where this particular prisoner was sent to, to prison um, so he went to this farmer and the news reports, what happened, they also seemed strange. It seemed like, you know, he just went to the farm and he killed the farmer and he left. Um, I think he shot him in the head, if I recall. It was a farmer in the free state. Um, and he's in prison. Um, so he says that sometime he's going to come out. Um, but he he's angry about the fact, that's what he said to me. He's angry about the fact that um, he has been uh rejected or left in the dark by the anc so his version of what happened is that he was actually given instructions by the anc to kill this person 
He spoke about the top six. He said he went to the two house. He's an old member of Mkantu Isizwe that we spoke about earlier. He was in exile, you know, one of these people we spoke about. Um, and he came back to South Africa and he was give for some political reason, he was told that he have to go, he has to go and murder this particular farmer. And he says that it was it was an instruction was given quite high up by someone in the ANC. And um when he was convicted, he asked them to help him and they pretended like they didn't know who he was. Um, and then they had some telephone conversations, I think beforehand and afterwards. And he said it was coming from the two Laos and he gave me the number. He said, this is the number that I think he's been using to call them. And we looked up the number. It's, an, it's a landline. It's a 011 number. And it was, in fact, a number for the two Laos. Um, and I asked him, well, why are you sharing this with, with us? I mean, you're a member of the ANC. Um, I'm with Afri Forum. Why are you telling me these things? And eventually, he, it came down to him saying that it, it's revenge for the fact that, that he was just left in, in the dust in this whole thing. So it seems a bit strange. I don't know. He could have been lying. It's very alarming, of course. So I went to see him twice in, in prison. Um, and um, he then... He, I said to him, well, you will, it, for us to really do something, to be able to do something about this, you need to make a sworn statement um, under oath that this is what happened. And he said he's prepared to do that. And then he came back and said, then he started setting demands. He said, no, I'll do that, but then you need to you know, pay for this and you need to give me money and all this. And I said to him, we're not going to do that. We're not going to pay you to make a statement. That's going to, firstly, I mean, just keep in mind that you are actually a farm murderer. You actually murdered someone and you're in prison for that. Secondly, there's no credibility in you signing a statement if we had to pay you to do it or we had to buy you a house or something. Um, and so then eventually it sort of died down those conversations. And that's why I was unsure if I should add that to the book, but eventually I did. Um, and it's very alarming. I think it's it's also a side of the discussion about farm murders that, that, that the impression I get is it's often swept when these things come up, it's swept under the carpet and it's, it's, it shows about this story. Um, so I don't want to make too many broad conclusions because it's not a hard evidence. It might be someone just telling a story, mm. but the story itself is very, very alarming. Is, is it possible? I mean, okay, it's possible now or likely that many of these murderers are former Encounter with Seasware members. Is it possible that many of them, it's, there's basically a bunch of serial killers running around in the province committing the same murders because many of these people are not found or prosecuted. So isn't it possible yes. that many, it's it's in, in many cases, the same people committing these murders? Because I, I know you, you show f photos in the book of people with military jammers on their back and they're well prepared. So the conclusion that you can draw is that these people, they know what they're doing and they've been doing it for some time. Yeah, well, I think firstly, it's a complicated phenomenon that every farm murder is not the same as the next or the previous, but some of these attacks are very clearly planned, you could say, with military precision. So there has been cases like the photo in the book about with, with attackers showing up to murder someone and then the one guy has a literally a military signal jammer on his back, um, a cell phone jammer. And then there has been cases, I mean, I've seen some of the CCTV footage where you can clearly see the people, the way in which they crawl the way in which they approach the property they had training the way in which they know everything about the property when should they duck when are they in the view of a window stuff like that um, you can clearly see they know exactly what they're doing um, other cases probably not it's just people running onto the property um, you know um, and i mentioned another example in the book of um, a case where the attackers changed clothes during one of these attacks um, they had overalls or something, and then they changed clothes um, of one of the attackers. There was a flash disk, um, and in the flash, on the flash disk, there was uh, photos of the farm uh, and the farmhouse um, from outside and inside. Um, so that's also clearly someone who went through a lot of effort to prepare, who used technology to prepare for this. Um, so there is certainly a side of this. Uh, we, we know that there has been some MK operatives um, who've been involved. We just don't know how many. Um, so there are a lot of unanswered questions about the attackers themselves, as far as their motives go and as far as their, 
allegiances to political organizations or other organizations and and so forth but i think also uh, we've been asked many times is there some grand conspiracy behind farm murders and i think just based on what we know the the answer to that is we're not aware there's no evidence of some big national conspiracy like the president giving orders or, or someone in the Thule house giving orders um uh, there's no evidence of that or hard evidence at least um but there there are definitely conspiracies uh, in in the plural and there's enough evidence of that of crime syndicates who have been involved with multiple farm attacks um and and one particular one i mentioned is actually one close to Janine, where i grew up where one such syndicate was exposed and they had a weapons cache with with a variety of arms and ammunitions and they were linked to uh, I think they were linked to 11 farm attacks. I'm not sure um, in, in that area. And another example is, is in the preface to the book, I mentioned some people whom I know who have been attacked or who have been murdered. And one of those people is my own brother. My brother was attacked on a farm or a small holding at least uh, in near Mulder's Drift, which is one of these farm attack hotspots. And his attackers was um, caught and convicted. And it turned out that they were involved with at least four farm attacks. And uh, my brother was actually the only one, or, or that particular farm attack was actually the only one of the incidents where the victim was not murdered or physically harmed. Um, and I think what happened in my brother's case was he was a, he's also a uh, pro professional hunter. So he had camouflage, camos, clothing, and stuff like that around the house. And then one of the attackers asked him, are you, are you with the military? And I don't think he answered. I, I maybe he might have said no. I'm not sure. But the attackers presumed him to be, you know, some member of the armed forces or something like that. And then they left. Um, so, so I mean, that's another example. It's, it's literally the people who attacked my own brother was was part of a syndicate who've been involved with multiple farm attacks. So, so there are definitely conspiracies. The question if there's one big overarching conspiracy, and um, I would say no, just because. If there is, there's no evidence of that or not sufficient evidence of that. Ernst, in the book, you made an interesting point that during the Soccer World Cup in 2010, there were virtually no farm attacks whatsoever. Why do you think that is? Well, that's up for speculation. It's it's very strange if you look at the data um, on farm attacks and farm murders. Um, if you do, for example, a column chart and, and you put up a column for every month, or every week and how many people were murdered and that's actually in the book and then suddenly in 2010 during the world cup i think it was four weeks i can't remember how much um suddenly there's nothing there's you know around before that and after that every month there are farm attacks and farm murders and then suddenly for four months there's nothing so you could say the, the reason is something like the country had this you know this the a festive spirit you could say that there was a lot of movement um but or you could say you can be more cynical and say that that the country this was an opportunity for South Africa to prove itself to the rest of the world um, that it is a country worth investing in and so forth. But it completely stopped. Um, and again, that's something that Afri Forum has spoken about quite a bit. And I know Tau SA, the Agricultural Union, has spoken about this and some others. But um, it's not re receiving any attention in the mainstream. No one's asking questions about this. Um, and it's a very strange thing that happened. That this has been some. This is something that's been going on every week since the nineteen since nineteen ninety, and suddenly in two thousand and ten it stops completely. And then when the World Cup is finished, it picks up again. Um, it's we we need to ask many more questions about about what actually happened there. Yeah, it's definitely suspicious. Uh, if, if if you compare the population of farmers with the average South African. How more mm. likely are you to be attacked as a farmer than the average South African? Because I know the argument is always made, okay, but crime in general is a problem in South Africa. But in the book, you lay out that being a farmer is far, far, far more dangerous. I think it's 17 times more yeah, likely. So, yes, yeah, exactly. So so um, that's the, the main response we get. And it was even the response from the president's office, um, Ramaphosa's office, he's, through his spokesperson, who said, yes, um, but just remember, there are many victims of murder and crime who are not farmers. And this is, if you compare, if you look at all the murders in South Africa, then 
farm murders is actually a small percentage of that, which is true. But that's also like saying, why are we concerned about rhino poaching? Because if we look at all the animals that are poached in South Africa, rhinos is a very small percentage of that. Um, and, and the point is that you need to con consider the size of the group. So you need to ask the question, how many farmers are there? How many people are in South Africa? And how many of those people get murdered? And we know that there's a, there are about 60 million people in South Africa and 20,000 is murdered in a year. And then you can ask the question, then you should ask, you shouldn't just say, oh, well, there are 20,000 murders in a year and what percentage of those are farmers? Oh, it's a small percentage. The question you should ask is how many farmers are there in South Africa and how many farmers have been murdered? Um, and and then, then it becomes a, a question of, a, you have to work out ratios. And it's quite difficult because we don't know the exact number of commercial farmers in South Africa. You can make estimates and some attempts have been made to do estimates and, and, um, and another way to look at this is, is to look at robberies in, um, in cities, in urban areas, and then compare that to robberies. So how many houses are there and how many house robberies are there, as opposed to how many farms are there and how many farm attacks are there? And some studies have been done in that regard. And one study found that, that the number is 16. So, so a, a, the chance of a robbery happening at a farm is about 16 times as much as at a, a house in a city. Another study found that it's about nine times as much. Um, and, and so there are many ways. It, it becomes quite a complicated debate, the whole thing about statistics. Um, the bottom line is that your chances are severely more, severely higher if you are a farmer to be attacked or to be murdered than if you are the average person living in a city in South Africa. The, the debate is just how much higher. That's the only thing. And, and it's something that you can argue about it this way or that way, but, but it's, it's, it's very concerning nonetheless. But I mean, regardless, even if it were true that crime in general was a problem and farmers weren't negatively affected, I mean, you could still just say we need, we need to stop crime full stop. It's not, okay, less hmm. of you are dying, so we don't care. I mean, what sort of an argument is that to make anyway? I mean, just... That's yeah. why crime in general and the rest of the world is not a problem because they say crime, we need to stop crime full stop. Yeah, exactly. So there are two things that are often said. The one is, oh, it's not a genocide, therefore we don't have to do anything about it. And then we Afroforum get accused of suggesting that there's a genocide, which is not our position. Um, and the other thing that we often hear is, well, it's there are many other crimes as well, so we don't need to do something particular about farm murders. But that's completely inconsistent with any line of basic policing um, and, and the approach that we have with priority crimes in general. To have a priority crime is not to say that the victims of this crime are more special than the victims of other crimes. If you say cash in transit heists is a priority crime, it's not because banks are more important than restaurants, for example, or whatever, and it would be ridiculous to claim that. It's, it is because this is a, a very unique crime. It has far reaching consequences and it's only going to be prevented or stopped if you develop a unique and a focused counter strategy. And it's the same with rhino poaching. I, don't, I haven't heard anyone say, oh, well, you don't care about elephants if you, if you are concerned about rhino poaching because poaching of elephants is also a problem. The fact is that rhino poaching is a very unique crime phenomenon. It's planned in a unique way. It's executed in a unique way. It has unique far-reaching consequences, um, and therefore it has to be addressed. Therefore, there has to be a unique and a focused counter strategy. And the same goes for, I mean, there are, there are various um, uh, priority crimes, like copper cable theft. No one is saying, oh, well, if you're concerned about copper cable theft, you don't care about household items that are stolen or jewelry that is stolen because copper cable theft is a unique crime phenomenon. But that same line of reasoning just doesn't stick when we, cut, when we talk about farm murders, then suddenly it's not applicable. And the fact of the matter, the, the most basic fact is it's a unique crime phenomenon that is planned in a unique way, executed in a unique way, and it has far reaching consequences. And as a result thereof, there should be a focused counter strategy. And, and government should take it seriously, but they just don't want to do it. And then they have all these, these excuses, which are completely irreconcilable with their views about other crime phenomena.
Mm, absolutely, yeah. Our government has like a doctor's degree in straw man arguments. But um, <laughs> and so the one last topic I want to touch on is the dismal state of our police officers, which you also mentioned oh, yeah. in the book. And it's really, I mean, that n- another frightening prospect is that you also lay out how many police officers are basically also criminals. Many of them have been implicated in crimes, and yet they are still police. Uh, the irony is they're supposed to be officers, officers of the law, and yet they have been implicated in yeah. crimes. So, so what's, what's the story there? Yeah, they don't want to get rid of them. Um, and I mean, they know who these officers are, and it's not difficult to find them. It's just, and it was a question, I think it was asked by the DA in Parliament, um, I think um, the Freedom Front has also said some things about this, Peter Grunewald and so forth, about the the actual convicted criminals who are police officers. And it's very shocking. So they actually gave statistics, the amount of murderers who are also police officers. So a police officer who has been found guilty of murder in the past or rapists or, um, you know, and then other crimes like, like assault and assault with uh, the intention to cause grievous bodily harm and so forth. I mean, we have, I, can't, I don't have the numbers with me. It's all in the book. There's a, a table with all the numbers. We have a significant portion of, of convicted rapists who are police officers in South Africa and convicted murderers who are police officers. Um, and the government knows that. These commissioner and, and the, the police headquarters know about this. And they, 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 it's very easy to get rid of those people. It's literally one decision. Um, but they don't want to do it. It's, and it's very, very shocking. It's very alarming. And, and that's only one side of the dismal state of, of the police in South Africa. Another part of it is people escaping prison. Uh, there are some shocking numbers about how many thousands of people have actually escaped prison in South Africa. And farm murderers in particular, sometimes under dodgy circumstances. Um, people who have been convicted of having committed farm murders just suddenly disappear and they're not in prison anymore. Um, um, that happens. Then um, the fact, I think it happened just after the book was published, which I certainly would have added to the book if it was before publication of the book. I think it was towards the end of 2018, the National Police Commissioner spoke in Parliament and he was asked about the crime situation. And he said something that is very, very significant. And it's quite difficult to find, again, because a lot of media just didn't report on it. So I'll have to go back in Hansart, um, you know, to find the actual notes of that meeting. But the National Police Commission has said in Parliament that the South African Police Service, Service does not have the capacity to fulfill its constitutional mandate. The constitutional mandate of the police is to keep the people of the country safe. And now we have the police commissioner saying, we have failed and we keep failing and we, we're not going to succeed in what it is that you want us to do. And that's a very, very significant thing not only about the state of the police, but about the political system in general. So again, so that's the bigger picture thing is, in theory, we have this wonderful constitution that talks about the right to human dignity and the right to life and the right to safety and security and all of these things. And and so according to the constitution, we all have a right to life and we all have a right to be safe. And then, but the reality is that the government itself says, we, we, we're not able to fulfill on uh, you know, we are not able to deliver on what the constitution declares or wants reality to be. Um, and that's, it says something about the bigger picture in South Africa that I think, again, it's something that we should talk about more. Absolutely. Ernst, I see our time is running out. Thank you so much for making the time to uh, to do this interview. Thank you so much for what your organization does, basically keeping South Africa alive while the government collapses around us. And thank you for your <laughs> excellent book. Is there anything you want to add or plug or say that before we conclude with this interview? No, I, I think, uh, well, thank you as also for this conversation and for going through the book. Uh, the book is still available. Um, sometimes I see it in bookstores. It's a, the book's now five years old, almost five years old, but it's it's on Amazon and, and you can get it on, on Kral Eitgevers' website. Um, I think there's a website, Kiel de Boer Book, I think, Kiel de Boer Book.com. Um, you can find it there. Um, and I think, I mean, you just said thank you for the work that AfriForum is doing. And, and, and I, we, we say this all the time, but AfriForum is a community organization and we wouldn't be able to do anything if we didn't have members supporting the organization. So, so I would like to use this opportunity to thank our members for, for making everything we do possible. Absolutely. And 
by all means, I don't see why I shouldn't recommend to our viewers to join Afriforum and to buy your book because it's so, I mean, be just ungeluk. I mean, you, you have to know these things. But to our viewers, yeah. you enjoy this content, please like this video, share it as widely as possible and subscribe to our channel. My name is Donald and you've been watching Worldview.